Um, now I'd like to introduce uh, Dr. Alex Rothkopf. I'm afraid I cannot do a proper introduction for him, but he's going to talk about something that is critically important that we've all learned in the um, pandemic, which is that a fragile supply chain can end up killing people. Um, let's see, before I do that, Sabia, do you want to close the poll about um, where, we are, where we are from? Thank, thanks to all our participants uh, for um, uh, doing that. Um, we've had a poll here. Uh, we are um, 29 people from North America, two from South America, 11 from Africa, eight from Europe, five from Asia, and none from Australia, which I'm sure is not true, but um, that's what we have. So thank you everybody uh, for uh, doing that. Um, and now um, I'm afraid, uh, Alex, I'm gonna have to ask you to introduce yourself because I don't know enough about you, but please go ahead. No worries, Rob, and thank you very much uh, for the invitation. I appreciate the opportunity to, to speak here today. Uh, as Rob said, my name is Alex Rothkopf. I'm a, a supply chain data science uh, expert. I've been doing this kind of work for the last And I just got muted. So, is that on me? We, we can hear you. Can you can hear me, right? Can, okay, cool. Yeah, are you, are you going to share anything or are you just going to speak? I'm just going to speak. Um, okay, great. Yeah, you So, as I, said, as I said, I've been working in supply chain and data science uh, for the last 12 years. Uh, I solely focus on global health and disaster response supply chains. And um, I have uh, I'm currently working with PATH. PATH is a, a international NGO, um, came out of a very technology focused um, area um, 40 years ago and has now a bunch of different programs active. One of them is specializing in oxygen, in particular in oxygen, what they call market dynamics, uh, which is, I'd say, a fancy term for trying to understand how business economics and market forces work in low um, and middle income countries and specifically here to understand how we can improve oxygen access uh, by looking at markets. So you know all of that, the fact that there are tons of challenges that are technological. A lot of the stuff that I already heard is about technology of how we can simplify technology, of how we can make them more um, reliable. There are a lot of legal issues that are going to come out in this conference, I'd say, um, and a lot of regulatory perspectives because we're talking about medical devices. They are supposed to be regulated. It's important that they are regulated. But I'm here today to uh, bring in a business perspective that I'm going to house under supply chain management, though for me, supply chain management is not very narrowly defined as logistics, but very broadly defined in looking at market competition sourcing policies, demand, supply, procurement, infrastructure, labor availability. So all of this has to come together to actually get a product close to, or a oxygen product close to a patient and deliver oxygen into his lungs. So I, I, I uh, term my talk uh, supply chains in distress for biomedical um, equipment supply chain. So why are they in stress? What are the problems that we are seeing out of the work that we undertake? So there are a lot of long-term consistent and persistent problems. Um, I'd say on the country and demand side, uh, a lot of this is about market fragmentation. If you're a company that is trying to engage in a market in a low resource setting, what you find typically is a lot of unorganized demand that results in high transaction costs. Could be unstructured funding. Uh, devices are procured from multiple hospitals, multiple local distributors are active. Um, there's a central medical store that's working on it. There are NGOs uh, working on it. So you have like a very unstructured um, market that you face. And there is no automation. It's all highly manual paper-based process with a lot of redundant documentation that makes it really hard for a company to just interact in this environment. We see challenges in procurement capacity constraints and inefficiencies in the process. So, for 
for example, the inconsistent, fu inconsistent funding for capital expenditure, which is particularly important for oxygen if you're thinking about bulk oxygen, making that av available requires an upfront, a substantial upfront investment into, for example, a oxygen plant or in a um, liquid oxygen tank to actually have con consistent continuous supply. But even if you're thinking lower scale, even a concentrator uh, requires some initial investment of between $600 to $1,000 just for the product itself. And then you need maintenance uh, and like, you need operational costs to maintain a product, to operate a product, to buy spare parts. That all requires funding. And what we find is like a lot of this funding is not missing or inconsistent. You find payment delays and payment defaults. You find that maintenance is reactive and unstructured. Um, you see that the availability of biomedical engineers, which are really crucial to actually make that equipment work, is uh, inconsistent or just not available. Um, so all of that together with the challenges that you as engineers are per perhaps more familiar with around the national regu regulatory bodies that make it hard to regulate a product uh, or make it hard to bring in new products. All of this like, shapes up to be a very compl complicated market for um, suppliers to engage in. On the other hand, like, that is all country and demand side driven challenges. Uh, on the other hand, on the other side, we have the supply side. And if you're looking at the supplies for um, different biomedical products, in particular for oxygen products, most of the devices, they are produced in Asia, in Europe, or in the US. And with that come specific challenges of acquiring these. You need to um, get in touch with these suppliers and these suppliers need to want to engage with local markets in some ways, or you need to go through distributors. Um, the long distance in itself poses already problems in terms of long lead times, a higher logistics cost, um, capacity constraints on the supply side. We saw a lot of that happening during COVID in the beginning. But there are also operational challenges of if your supply is further out, you have like import restrictions, tariffs um, on raw material parts and or the final product. Um, we see infrastructure challenges. So all of this comes together so that the supply side has troubles accessing and get or getting access to the demand side. And these would be a rough scope of what we see as long-term persistent problems. But then we also have a substantial chunk of short-term problems that are coming about through the pandemic. And I'm going to post a link in the chat uh, on a, of a new New York Times article that I find particularly enlightening um, when you're thinking about the short-term challenges. The gist of that article, let's see if I can drop that in here. I'm not sure. No, that didn't go through to everybody. Let me see if I can do that again. Here we go. So the gist of that article speaks to why we see these challenges in shipping products these days. So why is it so hard to procure something from Europe, from Asia, from, from, from the US? Um, it has a lot to do with how the pandemic unfolded. So at the beginning of the pandemic, the expectation of many companies was that through the social distancing shutdowns, um, we will see a drop in demand. Therefore, they started to lower their orders from their uh, port suppliers, from their manufacturers. But pretty quickly, we saw that despite the social distancing, demand was actually picking up. People were at home, they were buying stuff. Companies were not as affected as they originally thought. That like resulted in a huge change in ordering policies. So companies like started to buy more, order more. And if you are the recipient of that order, you think you see that spike coming towards you and you say, well, I'm going to order a little bit more. And the parts manufacturer to that supplier says, well, I'm going to order even a little bit more. So we call like the supply chain experts call that a bullwhip effect where there is an oversteering of the ordering process. And that is what the result, the end result of that is 
that um, the supply chains are pretty unbalanced. Uh, their demand is not matched with supply. And the results of that we're facing today with um, containers not being where they should be, containers piling up in one part of the world, mainly the US these days, because they are buying uh, a lot of products from, from Asia and containers not returning because the cycle is some, somewhat broken. We see um, um, container ships being rerouted uh, to work on very efficient routes that pay a lot of margin. We see uh, for the first time in, I, I'd say, I don't know, um, that um, container ships are fully booked. It's hard to get a container, a 42 inch container from, from Asia even at, into a booking line. And all of that results in a misaligned supply chain. And the result of that is that shipment is expensive these days. So when we were paying 15 to 2,500 for a container from Asia to the US, we are paying now uh, around $14,000, $15,000. Peak was around $20,000. That's a mismatch of supply and demand. A good that becomes rare is priced more expensively. We see that um, prices for products increase, right? Because if everybody wants something, prices increase. And we feel that as a consumer, but also we see, we see that in semiconductors, for example, pretty critical for our biomedical products. Um, we're missing those and the prices increase, which is all hurting in particular low resource settings because their income doesn't change just because the, the globe is out of balance it, and, and the prices jump. So we have that constrained shipment market that contributes to not being able to ship products as quickly as, I, as we would like to in a pandemic. Um, we see generally high demand for certain products. We see that logistics routes are being rerouted and there are already reports that I saw that African ports are less called on just because they're less effective, less efficient and less um, margin bound. And we see that raw materials and component parts are missing, right? It's just because they are sucked into a market that is constrained and uh, they are used somewhere else. This all results in us seeing the challenges of buying products in many different ways. We see that personally when we are buying stuff, um, when we're going to the grocery market, when we are going to, um, to buy something from, from the hardware store, but we see that in the same way when we're trying to buy a biomedical equipment for African or Asian or South American countries um, and try to like, balance price and cost. So what's the answer? The answer is what uh, supply chain experts call resilient supply chains. Um, so trying to get supply chains somehow to absorb some of these fluctuations. And there are like various standard concepts that supply chain experts would throw at um, and a problem to understand how, how they can solve that. So one is inventory. You just buffer against disruptions by piling up something in between, but you need to have money to do that. Same thing with capacity. You can build up more capacity uh, so that you can buffer against fluctuations. Another concept is multi-sourcing. So in, instead of buying from one firm, from one company, you're trying to source it from multiple companies if they are available so that if one company is either capacity constraint or for whatever reason not available, you can go to another co company. Um, you can try to aggregate demand in some way so that your demand uncertainty is aggregated, like there's a statistical effect coming uh, into play here that should improve your forecasting accuracy and thereby you can improve uh, your ordering. Or you can try to nearshore, you can try to, instead of buying it from Asia, you're trying to buy it closer to the market so that your lead times reduce, the number of stages in between reduce so that you save in terms of interaction and coordination and transaction costs. And um, typically there is that idea of information sharing because information is, is critical in supply chains and misinformation is the adversary of any supply chain. And the bullwhip effect that I mentioned earlier is essentially a 
result of misinformation. Someone thinks that someone else will do something, probably order more or order less, and oversteers their own ordering towards their suppliers. So reducing the bullwhip effect uh, would be um, trying to be tackled by information sharing. These concepts, they all come with a cost, right? It's like an insurance policy, like the insurance policy we all buy if we're trying to insure against a hazard of our house or a hazard in, um, in, in traffic. Um, they all come at a cost and we need to balance whether it's worth buying that insurance or taking on the risk. And in the past, many of the firms um, have been, for example, trying to reduce inventory because it's heavy on the balance sheet. So they would be not buying inventory insurance. And in a disastrous case, they would be paying with not being able to deliver, right? How does that now become specifically relevant to biomedical equipment supply chains and the question at hand here about open sourcing? I thought I tried to get into that piece a little bit by um, thinking about a subcomponent or spare parts manufacturing. So suppose you get the, all these hurdles done and open source a spare part or a subcomponent part. Um, what would that entail? What that, would that benefit you in terms of supply chains? Well, first you would impact competition and availability because suddenly not, it's not only the OEM, the original equipment manufacturer that will produce that specific spare part, but kind of anybody can. And hopefully someone is interested in that market and is attracted to that market. So you democratize essentially the spare part and thereby should improve it through multiple sourcing. Um, you can think about being able to manufacture products locally, either with a fancy way of 3D printing, but maybe even with a simple or uh, typical mechanical physical production process. If you're able to local source that product or local produce that product, you're reducing lead times, you're re reducing the variability in lead times that also should reduce your logistics costs. You should also be improving demand visibility because you're closer to your market, the lead time shrinks and it's easier to just forecast what will happen. So it becomes suddenly a more attractive market environment for a supplier to work in. And you're solving that from a supplier side perspective, essentially. Um, but all of this local, por local parts producing comes with the challenges that we may already have thought about or not. Like capital availability and interest rates are very different from a US or European context if you're trying to do set up a manufacturing site in a, a lower resource setting. Infrastructure cap questions um, are always around, uh, around electricity, water. Um, the talent gap is always a big question. Can I actually produce to the quality that is required? And can I acquire enough talent on the engineering side, on the production side, on the, on the management side to actually produce uh, here? Regulatory structure, you will touch on this to, today, I, I imagine a lot of times, but it also will be regulation of manufacturing plants. Where, where that becomes uh, critical. So in summation, how, many, how much time do I have, Rob? Uh, 10, well, we have 10 minutes, but we'd like to get to some questions and let people yeah. have a little break. Okay, I'm going to wrap up with uh, three thoughts and then we can um, have some questions. So one, I wanted to mention, do we need to actually produce locally or can we produce close to a local market? Um, that would still be very attractive from a supply chain perspective, but it may not entail the same complications. So can you move closer to an African market, but not directly into an African market or use that as a stepping stone into an African market might be a really worthwhile consideration because it in, brings you a lot of the supply chain benefits and may avoid some of the risks and challenges you may face. Then I wanted to mention the systems thinking part. Um, we shouldn't focus too much on this one part and the manufacturing of that one part because it doesn't buy you a lot to think about that. If that one part has um, core components um, or raw materials that are then sourced from overseas again, then you're just like moving the problem up one stage. 
Um, and I wanted to underline a business thinking um, piece. It, it, I think it's very admirable and very um, exciting, the avenue that you're undertaking, but it all will only be coming worthwhile if it turns into a business opportunity for companies, for firms to actually engage in. So beyond the technology, the regulatory, think also about is there actually a business opportunity coming along or what can we actually advocate for that business opportunity already, for example, through all the supply chain thinking that I tried to present here today, or do we need to do something about this to, um, to ensure that we're not forgetting about the business components and then we have all the technology in place and all the legal and regulatory frameworks solved, but the business opportunity is still not there. So thinking about that, I, I, I would very much like encourage for that and um, very happy to engage and discuss and support that. And with that, I'm going to conclude. Thank you very much for the time. Um, you muted, Thank Robert. You. Yeah. Thank you very much, Dr. Brockhoff. Um, and so um, in a minute, uh, Alex may move to Rehive. And uh, it looks like there are a lot of people at the speakers table, those of you who want to ask him further questions um, may wish to go there. Um, you can also submit questions um, through the Q&A button at the bottom of your Zoom uh, window, which is a good way to submit questions. I, ha I have a, a question for Alex. So if I understand what you just, what you just said, if you're a manufacturer, you in general would prefer to have multiple sources for a part which you need. And you might even prefer that that be an open source part because that would mean that you would have a lot of potential suppliers. But you might not be willing to pay more for those if you thought there was a steady supply under other circumstances. You know, in America, a lot of times there's what I would call the tyranny of the spreadsheet, right? If you can put dollars on it and put it on the spreadsheet, it's real, a benefit which is unmeasurable, even if it's a real benefit, is often hard it, hard for the unreal benefit to compete with the spreadsheet. It, is there a way a firm can make that kind of a, is there a framework that already exists for making that kind of risk-based decision? Yes, there is. So resources have been working on that for quite a while, and there are ways to quantify these types of risks. I myself have worked on that. I can share a paper uh, where we looked at this for the for DMPA. It's a subcutaneous uh, sub um, um, product where we looked at what would happen in a market if in addition to one supplier, we get a second source. How does that diversify our um, lead time risks? And can we balance that lead time risk, quantify a monetary value of that and determine if multi-sourcing, which usually leads to you paying more, uh, can outweigh um, the, like, can outweigh the, the, the drawbacks of multi-sourcing. And there are other ways uh, and other approaches where you can, for example, work with an insurance-based approach. We've done that in the humanitarian space where we look at how should a actually governmental organization um, pre-position inventory across a certain geographic area uh, to respond to crisis. How much should they invest into that and how much should they rely on responsiveness of their upstream supply chain to serve people in distress? And you, could, you can put money on that uh, or dollar values on that. It just requires a little bit more um, calculation methodology than your average um, supplier scoring scheme that you see uh, typically being used. Well, it sounds it sounds a little uh, highfalutin as well. You know, it sounds like a small firm might have difficulty doing that. Um, you know, if you're a very large firm, you you could try to make that decision. Um, but it might be might be difficult for um, for small firms. Um, to do that, and and I, don't, I I assume it's also relatively difficult for small firms to um, purchase inventory insurance, right? I mean, is that 
normally done by small firms or only very large firms? So you're not you're not buying insurance on the inventory, but you're using the inventory as insurance. So instead of running a very lean supply oh, chain, okay. you have almost right. no inventory and you're kind of hoping okay. that your supplier will deliver. Um, you're putting something on stock, you're incurring uh, a financial cost for that because you need to finance that inventory. Okay. Um, and you're accepting that as a risk premium, if you will, to ensure that your supply chain doesn't um, break at some point. Okay, that, that, makes, that makes perfect sense. Um, Okay, well, thank you very much, Alex. There aren't any questions submitted here. Um, Alex is gonna go to Rehive. Um, it looks to me like at Rehive, there are a bunch of people in the speakers table. I have been told, although I don't know why this ought to be the case, that Rehive works better if you leave Zoom. And so it might be that our panelists should simply leave Zoom, go to Rehive and come back. Uh, for some reason, there's an issue with the mic uh, being used in two places. It may depend on the kind of equipment you have. So I recommend that our panelists do that. Um, uh, I would like to hear in the chat, because I don't have time to go to Rehive, if people are enjoying it, if it's making sense, if someone can put in the Zoom chat here, if they're, they're able to do it. Um, you know, maybe it's only the panelists talking to each other there. Um, now, in thank you very much, Dr. Rothkoff. Um, um, supply chain issues are very complicated, but we can't shy away from them. And so I hope people will think of questions that I have been too busy to think of and ask them of Alex uh, when, when he, he goes there. 